This week, we celebrate our 500th episode of the 3-Minute Market Insight. Since 2010, we haven't missed a beat giving you the latest in seafood news every Monday morning. If you followed along the headlines surrounding the Pebble Mine recently, it's evident that what should be a science-based environmental debate has been turned into an epicenter for political controversy. We spoke to experts on the ground in Alaska to bring you the precise scientific facts regarding the extent of the damage to the ecosystem this mine could incur. For a brief introduction, the Pebble Group are currently offering the shorter version of their project, a 50-year mine, in order to gain the necessary environmental permits. This would only remove 20% of the deposit and includes constructing immense infrastructure in order to access these metals, which includes roads, installation of hydro lines, and a perpetual water treatment plant for the oxidized sulfuric materials that will also need to be excavated. However, when speaking to the potential investors, they are pitching the full 70 to 80 year mine in order to access the half a trillion dollar deposit. With this new infrastructure, it will create a gateway for mines of the numerous untouched deposits all over the Alaskan tundra. The Pebble Mine project not only poses an immediate threat to the Nushigak and the Kijak rivers, some of the largest salmon supplying rivers in the world, but to the future of sustainable wild salmon. First, we spoke to aquatic and fishery sciences professor Daniel Schindler from the University of Washington, who explains the exact ramifications this project would have on the Bristol Bay habitat. Their assumption is, is that they can develop this mine, excavate it, get out all the ore, and then put the waste material back into that pit, close it up and go away. And they could do all that in 50 years. Well, there's two right. problems with that scenario. One is that one of the minerals that, or one of the elements that's most abundant in the deposit is sulfur. Sulfur has basically no industrial value, no economic value, mm -hmm. so they're not going to remove it. They will have to store it on site. And the problem with that is that the sulfur there right now is bound up in things like pyrite, fool's gold, and these sort mm -hmm. of things, which is very stable and no risk except when it gets oxidized. And the way it gets oxidized is it gets ground up, exposed to water and oxygen, and it forms sulfuric acid. And then you have a risk of both the sulfuric acid reducing the pH, making it more acidic, in other words. But when you reduce the pH, you make the residual metals more soluble. And then you have this, you know, people call it a toxic soup, and that sounds, you know, overly dramatic, but it's a reality. When you store these sulfur bearing waste rocks, you produce acids that are battery acid with heavy metals mixed into them. Mm -hmm. That stuff doesn't go away. It doesn't disappear. It doesn't volatilize. It, the only way it goes away is by leaking out into the surrounding landscape. You know, the reason Bristol Bay is such a productive place for salmon is because it's a wet place. There's lots of water flowing across the landscape and it was heavily glaciated during the last major glaciation. And what that did was leave all these gravels on the surface of the land, and that makes water flow everywhere. Yep. That makes it a perfect storm for fish, but it makes it a perfect storm to mess it up via trying to store contaminants on the landscape forever. It's just not going to be possible. Groundwater moves all over the place. The bottom of this, I mean, sometimes it's hard to fathom how big this pit's going to be. The yep. bottom of the pit is going to be thousands of feet below sea level. And, you know, I like to say their assumptions are that time, time stands still, namely that they don't need to worry about this beyond 50 years. The other assumption they're making is that gravity doesn't operate in Bristol Bay. And, of course, gravity is what moves water downhill. And with all that water comes all these contaminants that the water is going to get loaded up with. Schindler explains that what makes the Bristol Bay fisheries so sustainable is the hugely diverse portfolio effect of the waterbeds. This land has a huge variability in numbers of fish, and when one area is a bust, another will boom to compensate. Unfortunately, when you start wiping out a part of this habitat, that sustainability can quickly erode and fall apart. In Bristol Bay, in terms of dollars and cents, depends on what number you use, but the Bristol Bay fisheries are worth between half a billion and one and a half billion dollars every year. Annually. 
And then you ask, well, how much money is actually put into keeping the system going? And it's a couple million bucks. So if you want to talk about return on your investment, you know, leaving it alone is one of the best things we can do from a purely economic standpoint. Next, we spoke with Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association's Executive Director, Andy Wink, who created an independent study to compensate for much of the Army Corps of Engineers' oversight to get the fishery's perspective on the potential risks involved not only with the mine site, but the transportation corridor itself. You know, anytime you're talking about crossing, uh, you know, anadromous streams, there's there's risk to affect those those runs, and so there's a lot of streams that that cross uh, that transportation corridor as well. This this ore pipeline, um, you know, we we haven't seen a lot of background information on that about how stable that is, how safe that is, and so if you had a rupture in that as well, that could cause more destruction. Talking about trucks, uh, the you know copper dust. And it doesn't take a lot of copper in the water to affect salmon's ability to smell and evade predators. Um, there's been quite a few studies on how the prevalence of copper in, in rivers affects salmon. And uh, you know, if you're spreading that dust out along these, these creeks and rivers, um, that could be another thing that you know, could affect salmon survivability and salmon productivity. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a lot of risk, not just in the mine area itself, but all along the transportation corridor uh, to get this ore out. And they found a very direct correlation between the bigger the structure is, the more material tends to come out when, when there's a breach. Um, and so because of the size of this, and again, this is the small mine scenario that doesn't appear to be economically feasible, but even under that, smaller uh, smaller mine print and tailings dam, it would be about 10 times as large as Mount Polly. And it's pretty catastrophic. You know, in Mount Polly, there was a very deep lake um, not too far downstream that, you know, kind of caught a lot of that uh, toxic material. Um, but that's not the case in, in this area. The supply chain is really big. This fishery is massive. It's the most valuable wild salmon fishery in the world. Um, our fish go all over the world, all over the United States. And, and so it, it, it affects businesses all over the, the U.S. And those in the supply chain should, should, I think, let members of Congress know that this permitting process has not been up to par. Uh, you know, Senator Murkowski has said numerous times that it needs to meet a high bar. She's not seeing that. And I think other senators and representatives from other states need to join in and give, give support to, to some oversight here because it's, it's pretty clear to us that, um, that you know, the, the rules of NEPA and the, the, the permitting, um, you know, permitting requirements around environmental safeguards are not being uh, looked at deep enough for such an important project. And so, you know, when federal agencies don't do their job, it's uh, Congress's job to step in and, and exercise oversight and make sure that they are following the rules and uh, serving the American public. It is no secret that this project comes with a fiery backlash from those who seek to protect these lands, including joined efforts on behalf of commercial and sport fisheries, as well as tribal communities, all of which usually struggle to come to an agreement on resources. We spoke to Daniel Chayette, VP of Lands and Resources for the Bristol Bay Native Corporation, a for-profit organization whose shareholders are the native people of Bristol Bay, which has been publicly opposed to the project since 2009 to take a closer look at the social economic effects this would have on the surrounding communities. There are a whole host of reasons why this is moving very fast. None of them are good reasons. Uh, and the loser in all this it will be the, the people of Alaska, the people of Bristol Bay, and the salmon fishery. I mean, the reality is the U.S. government, the Canadian government, has over the, the past many decades spent billions of dollars trying to resurrect once abundant and flourishing salmon streams and habitats uh, to very little effect. 
And, and yet here we have what is perhaps the world's greatest wild sockeye salmon fishery that still exists and thrives. And we are somehow charging forward trying to, to destroy it. Um, it. If it wipes out the salmon fisheries, uh, then a subsistence lifestyle that people have lived for thousands of years uh, potentially could be gone. It could be, it could be heavily changed or damaged. Um, the, the commercial fishery is absolutely at risk. Uh, that's a commercial fishery that has been, it's going on about 135, 140 years, um, which is a much shorter time period, but it is the economic backbone of the region. There is, I think, hardly a family in Bristol Bay that doesn't have some connection to the commercial fishery, and, and all that would all that would, would change. One of the strengths of this fishery is, is its reputation and its brand that this is, you know, these are wild salmon. It is a pristine, they come from pristine waters. Um, this is the highest quality product you can purchase. Um, even if nothing goes wrong, the mere fact that you got a huge open pit mine at the headwaters is gonna damage that brand. The tundra <clears throat> where this project would be built is essentially a sponge. There is no disconnect. There is no um, barrier between surface and groundwaters. This is just the wrong place to have a potentially contaminating water-dependent enterprise. In June of this year, Pebble Mines developers began offering Pebble Mine performance dividends that are only paid upon the beginning of construction in four to five years and over 700,000 jobs to gather more support from the locals. While the region is in need of more employment, it being a challenging location to reside, he assumes most of the high paying engineering jobs would be given out to out of state professionals and locals would mainly be assigned menial minimum wage work. These are not jobs, says Chayette, worth destroying local ecosystems that have supplied the communities with over 140 years of employment and thousands of years of subsistence living. Pebble Mine's footprint is much larger than one mine and one fishery. These decisions shift our priorities away from our sustainable and wild seafood resources. This infrastructure creates a gateway to all of the other mineral deposits in Alaska, putting the entire area at risk to what could be the beginning of the end to one of the most productive and sustainable wild salmon fisheries in the world. If you are interested in how you can help, we've left some links below to resources and information. Thank you for joining me for the 500th episode of the Tradex Foods 3-Minute Market Insight. This has been Tasha Cadence reminding you to stay safe, buy smart, and eat more seafood.